Welcome to uh, ZOA's Israel update. Why is this election different from all other elections? Uh, this is our first ZOA Zoom with ZOA event of 2021 that isn't a book club event, so we're excited to have you all here. I am Alan Jay. I'm the ZOA Director of Outreach and Engagement. During the webinar, I'll put my email address in the chat function, so if you have any reason to reach out, you have any questions or thoughts or comments about ZOA, please do not hesitate to email me personally. This is the first of what we hope will be a regular series of ZOA updates from Israel. In fact, Dan will speak more about this during today's webinar, but please mark your calendars for three consecutive Sundays, February 7th, 14th, and 21st at 11 a.m. on each day, Eastern Standard Time. So those of you in Israel do a quick calculation. As ZOA will present as part of our sovereignty series, a three-part Judea and Samaria mega event featuring many prominent Israeli influencers, senior ZOA staff, and of course, today's host, Dana Luz. You won't want to miss this insider's look at this seminal issue. With the rollout of the vaccines, we at ZOA hope and pray that we are finally seeing the light at the end of the proverbial COVID tunnel. That said, we've received so much positive feedback about our virtual programming that I'd like to assure you that we will fully intend to continue offering quality Zoom with ZOA programming even after, please God, life returns to pre-pandemic normal. Watch your emails and please check in to our website to see our scheduling. <clears throat> As our topic today speaks to the election in Israel, I wanna take a minute to remind you and our audience that as a 501c3 organization, ZOA is prohibited and does not support or advocate for any party or for any particular candidate. We pursue our principal positions not in a bipartisan fashion, but rather employing a completely nonpartisan approach. We always have and we always will work toward the goal of securing Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state within the borders promised to the Jewish people in Torah and by international law. We always have and always will continue to fight anti-Semitism here in the United States and abroad. Today's feature, now let's get to today's featured event. Dana Luz is ZOA's representative in Israel. Originally from Montreal, Canada, Dan moved to Israel after finishing legal studies at McGill University and specializing in international law. Dan worked in the International Law Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a legislative advisor to the Likud and the Knesset and has held senior management positions in Israel's third sector. And in reserve duty, Dan continues to serve as an international law advisor to the IDF. Dan is married and he and his wife live in Jerusalem. Dan, I know you're excited as I am to get on with this program. Please help us understand why this election is different than all other elections. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, and thank you everyone for being here. The way I'm going to uh, divide this program is that I have a presentation uh, that I'll present for uh, the first part of the program. It's going to take about half of the program. And afterwards, the second half uh, is going to be a questions and answers period. So uh, one second, let me just make sure the presentation works here. And the, the part of the presentation is also going to be divided into a few parts. I'm going to speak about basically, as Alan uh, said, about the, the elections that will be happening in the end of March in Israel and trying to understand how they, they're different uh, to all other elections that we've had in Israel. And we've been having a lot of elections uh, lately in Israel. And that's also something we'll be speaking about. So in order to do that, what I'll do is first of all, look at the past, the past few elections and also the more distant past. Basically we'll look at the last 10 years. Uh, we'll do this rather quickly, but we'll try to understand some trends in Israeli politics uh, in the last 10 years. Afterwards, we'll speak about the issues that are relevant to this specific election. And we'll look at the possible outcomes uh, at the end of the presentation. And afterwards, I'll again, I'll take questions and answers. Please feel free to ask questions also that aren't directly related to the, uh, to the, to the presentation. The, the idea of this uh, monthly or bi-monthly or regular update, uh, however uh, we'll do it, uh, is that uh, I want to be here in order to connect you with whatever is going on in Israel. Uh, and so feel free to ask questions that are of interest to you. Now, before I get 
uh, into uh, a little bit of uh, history of the, the past 10 years, uh, I want to speak about the political system. I know that many of you uh, will know what I'm going to say uh, right now, and so I'll keep it brief. Uh, the political system in Israel is different uh, than the political system in the United States, and honestly, most of the world. Uh, the democracy in Israel works in a different way. Uh, the main differences are two main differences that also directly affect the themes that I will be discussing today, and so I want to uh, describe them a little bit. First of all, uh, in Israel, you don't vote for a person or representative that then represents your area in Congress or in Parliament or in the Knesset. What you vote for is a party, and the party has a list, uh, and then the, the, the members of Knesset are divided proportionally according to the proportion of votes that each party got. Uh, when you vote, you can see on the left over there uh, on the screen a uh, uh, bunch of different ballots. Uh, each of them uh, represent a different party. You vote for a party and then that, that's your vote. You don't vote for a certain person. That's step number one. Step number two is after the election. What defines which government rules in Israel is not necessarily uh, the person who got the most votes, but rather the person who is able to form a coalition. And you can have different types of coalition. I put here two different pictures of some, uh, of, some of the coalitions we've had in the past few years. Uh, you can see one of them, which uh, I, I won't get into details, but one of the one on the right is a pretty homogenous right-wing uh, coalition. The one in the center uh, is, a, uh, is a coalition that includes some right-wing and some centrist parties and even some left-wing parties, which is what we usually call in Israel a national unity uh, coalition. This is just the two differences that uh, I wanted to stress. Number one, that there's uh, lists and parties, you vote for parties, and number two, that you need to form a coalition. So now we'll try to look a little bit at the past 10 years. And I start 10 years ago, uh, a little bit more than 10 years, sorry, time has passed uh, quickly. But I start in 2009 uh, because in two th the 2009 election was a very significant el election in Israeli history for two reasons. First of all, it was the, the first elect, it was the election in which uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu got reelected. Uh, and now, uh, since then, he has become the longest serving Prime Minister in Israeli history. He had taken a break from politics and returned in 2009. The second reason, and that's one of the things that I wanna discuss more in depth today, is that that was the first election where a new concept came into Israeli politics which has been uh, since then the concept basically ruling Israeli politics. And that concept is the right wing bloc. And let me try to, under to explain what, what, I, what, what this means. On the night of the election, when the results came out, it became clear that Kadima, which was a center right, uh, center left, sorry, party uh, uh, in, in Israel, uh, got more seats than the Likud, which is a right wing or center right wing. Uh, party. And so it seemed that the left uh, won. Uh, that, that, that's what it looked like. But on that night, Netanyahu went to the media and said, don't uh, get to conclusions too quickly. Actually, I will be able to form a coalition even if I didn't get the most seats. And this is when he uh, revealed an alliance that he made with the ultra-Orthodox parties, uh, which basically since then, uh, has been the alliance which we call the right-wing bloc and that has ruled Israeli politics uh, ever since. Uh, the, the, if we go back, we can see I put the, the different parties uh, in a color-coded uh, way. The blue is the right-wing uh, uh, bloc, the yellow is the left-wing bloc, uh, and then the red is the Arab bloc. Those are colors that are going to be with us throughout the, uh, the presentation. And here you can see the same colors that, that I've used. Now, the way that you form a coalition in Israel is that you need at least 61 seats, a majority of the Knesset. Uh, and so you can see here that with that alliance, uh, together with the ultra-Orthodox parties, uh, Netanyahu was able to form a coalition of, uh, uh, which was based on a bloc that had 65 seats. Uh, and, uh, and But what I want to stress here is that this wasn't something that was necessarily obvious, because the ultra-Orthodox parties in the past had, uh, had served under 
left-wing go government and the right-wing governments. And this was really a first where they were becoming inherently part uh, of the right-wing bloc. And I put a little, uh, a little uh, uh, graph uh, on the left of the screen in order to show you that actually, if we take out that alliance from the picture, then the election was much strong, uh, much closer, and no one got none of the uh, pure, purely right wing or purely left wing blocks got to 61 seats, and so they basically became, on the one hand, decision makers, uh, and on the other hand, uh, they also helped create this block. Now, this block continued with us over time, and now I'll get to the to the other results. Uh, quite quickly, but one, uh, there's a few things that I do want to stress in each of these results. First of all, let me go back to the 18th Knesset, which was in 2009. You see that the big center-left party was called Kadima. In the 19th uh, Knesset, the biggest center-left party is called Yeshatid. You will see that this is a trend that in every election, there's a center-left party that comes up, and it's always the different party. It's not the same name. It always changes. Uh, in this election, then you can see that uh, the Likud and Israel Betain, which was another party uh, of uh, Avigdor Lieberman, uh, who basically re represents um, uh, his base is Russian people who made Aliyah to Israel, but he also has other borders. Uh, they ran together, got 31 seats. Here he did get the most seats. But the reason, again, why he won this election is not because he got the most seats, Netanyahu, the Likud, right? The reason is because he in that alliance between the right wing and the ultra-Orthodox parties, you had 61 seats, which allowed, uh, which allowed them to really form a coalition. And I, I want to tell you that in 2013, the coalition that he ended up forming wasn't based on, on, on the ultra-Orthodox parties, but still the reason that he won the election is because of this alliance, because the way it works is that every party that is represented in the Knesset has to tell uh, the, the, the president who he supports as prime minister and the person who gets the most votes uh, is the person who is considered prime minister. And so even though they weren't part of the coalition because of things that I don't want to get into right now because they're less relevant to this election, uh, they were still the reason why he was prime minister. Uh, and then we go on uh, the 20th Knesset in 2015, uh, you have again, a new uh, center left party, the Zionist Union, uh, the Likud, uh, which gets the most seats. But again, the reason why uh, the Netanyahu won is because the right-wing bloc got more than 61 seats. And now we're getting into the last two years. In the last two years, basically this system, which worked for, the, for around 10 years, uh, from 2009 to 2019, uh, broke. And there are a few reasons why it broke. First of all, a Victor Lieberman, which I mentioned uh, a, few, a few minutes ago. Let me say a, a few words about him. A Victor Lieberman is someone who moved to Israel from the former Soviet Union. He established a party which was heavily based uh, on uh, Olim, on people who moved to Israel uh, from the former Soviet Union. And he was very identified with the right-wing bloc. But in 2019, in the in the elections to the 21st Knesset, uh, he decided to leave the right-wing bloc, and we'll see that in the results very soon. The second reason is Netanyahu's legal troubles. Uh, Netanyahu had some legal troubles, and I don't want to get into the questions on whether, uh, uh, right now, if you want to ask questions afterwards, you can, but there's different opinions about whether uh, Netanyahu's legal troubles are, are uh, real or if it's just political uh, witch hunt, etc. Everyone in Israel has a different uh, opinion, uh, but these legal troubles have some political uh, impact on some of the people on the right who, for, for these reasons, decide to vote for other people. And the third reason was a division in the right. And we'll see this immediately, very soon, when we see the results of the uh, elections to the 21st Knesset. Right-wing parties uh, split into many smaller parties, and some of them didn't pass the threshold. What does the threshold mean? If you don't get at least 3.9% of the votes in Israel, then you don't make it uh, 3.25, sorry, percent uh, of the votes uh, uh, in Israel, uh, then you don't make it into the Knesset. Uh, you just don't make it. Even though you could have had one or two or three seats, 
uh, you still, you won't make it because you didn't pass that threshold. That's what the law says. So let's see the results of the 21st Knesset. You see that the Likud and blue and white, again, a new center-left party, uh, got the same amount of seats. But as I said, what really matters is the blocks. You see here that you have Zehut, which is Moshe Fagrin's party, and New Right, which was Naftali Bennett's party. They both were right-wing parties that didn't pass the threshold. Uh, and then I put here Israel Beteinu, which is a Victor Lieberman's party in green, a new color that we didn't see up until now. And the reason is that he decided that this time he won't go with the right-wing parties. There's different uh, opinions by different people as to why he did that. Some people think that he has some personal issues with Netanyahu that didn't treat him well enough. Uh, he personally will say that the reason why he did that is that although he's right wing uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to security issues uh, and things like that, when it comes to religion and state issues, uh, he's against the alliance between the ultra orthodox and the right, and therefore he wanted to split from that alliance. Uh, that's that's what he explains. Uh, but now let, let's look at what could have been and what was in in effect. If the right wing bloc would have stayed a bloc, including a Victor Lieberman in that Knesset, then even without Bennett and Feiglin uh, passing the threshold, we would have still had 65 seats. However, since he left the bloc and didn't want to recommend Netanyahu or join a coalition led by uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, then we only, then the, the right-wing bloc only had 60 seats. Uh, and that's not 61. And therefore, that's not enough votes in order to establish uh, a government. And so that's what happened. In this, in this situation, then there's uh, two possibilities. Uh, either you create a government which isn't homogenous, and that's a national unity government, or uh, you create a government, uh, or you go back to elections. You cannot uh, create a government, and you go back to elections. What happened this time around was that they went back to elections. And then we can see that in the 22nd and the 23rd Knesset, I didn't bring the results here because they were very similar, but you can see that almost the same thing happened. The right actually uh, was weaker in the 22nd uh, election. Uh, in the 23rd, they were a little bit uh, uh, bigger, but still they never got to 61 votes. Avigdor Lieberman stayed in his own block. He didn't want to go not with the right and not with the left. Uh, and then we, we basically got to this impasse, which didn't allow for uh, any government to be established. In the 23rd elections, people felt that three consecutive elections was too much. Uh, and so people really wanted a solution. And so the right, uh, and, and so there were, there were basically two options, three options on the table. One option again was to go to a fourth election, which people didn't want. The second option uh, was to try and create a left-wing government, which is supported by both Avigdor Lieberman and the Arabs. The Arabs are in red. They had 15 seats. Uh, Avigdor Lieberman is in green. Uh, and then in orange, you have the left-wing government, uh, the left-wing uh, left uh, parties. And they would want to create an alliance in order to allow for uh, the establishment of a government. This actually almost happened. and. Uh, Again, we're, uh, we're 501c3, we don't take sides when it comes to parties, but I think that on this issue of uh, making an alliance with people who don't recognize uh, the right uh, for, for, for Israel to exist as a Jewish state, this is something which uh, we can all agree is something which is very, very bad. Uh, inside the left-wing bloc, there were some people that really opposed that for uh, Zionist reasons. They said, okay, we don't wanna support such a government. And therefore, it didn't actually happen in the end because of people inside the bloc that uh, refused to see it happen. And so what you had is one option left. The last final option that was on the table was to try and create a national unity government, which included both the right wing and the left wing bloc. And this is basically what happened. Uh, it was also at the beginning of the COVID crisis. And so people were, were feeling that we needed to find some type of way to work together in order to deal with the COVID crisis. And you had Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, uh, Benny Gantz, the leaders of both of the blocs that signed a coalition agreement that lasted 
around one year. And unfortunately, it didn't last very long, uh, but it lasted for the duration basically of the crust of the COVID crisis, even though we'll see that we're not out of the woods just yet. But that's, that's basically what happened. But then a few months ago, uh, this, uh, this uh, government, which is based on very different ideologies, uh, didn't manage to survive and therefore it fell. And that's what brings us to this election. Uh, and that's when I finished the historical part and I start speaking with present day, uh, about present day issues. We're now headed to a new election, which is going to happen in the end of March. Uh, and now we're going to speak about what the different issues are that will affect this election and what the potential outcomes could be. So first of all, the issues. Uh, one is COVID. Uh, and this is definitely a big issue. It's a big issue all around the world. Uh, but as you will see in Israel, it might actually cause a type of tectonic shift uh, in the way politics are seen in Israel. Uh, it's, it, it might, it won't necessarily, uh, but uh, we'll discuss this uh, very soon. Uh, COVID in general in Israel has been uh, relatively well managed, and yet a lot of people have a lot of criticism about many of the decisions. They feel that some of the decisions were politicized. Uh, when you look at it on an international level, some people from outside of Israel are a little uh, shocked that uh, there is so much criticism. But in Israel, we, we like perfection. So when it's not perfect, we have a lot of criticism. Uh, and so there is a lot of criticism on COVID and there could be a heavy political price on the incumbent, like in many other places in the world, uh, because of COVID. Uh, the second thing is that Netanyahu was indicted. Uh, and because he was indicted, this also is moving some right-wing people uh, who, who, who feel that a prime minister that's been indicted shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be in power uh, to move uh, against Netanyahu. And the third thing is the peace process. Uh, and by peace process, I mean two things. I mean the Abraham Accords, which uh, basically uh, made the other peace process that we were used to hear of uh, which is peace with the Palestinians, almost uh, irrelevant. Nowadays in Israel, if it used to be the number one issue on people's mind when they went to the polls, uh, now it's become less relevant. And because this is less relevant, and because the right and left in Israel was always divided according to whether you're for the peace process or against the peace process uh, with the Palestinians, uh, the blocks have become uh, much less relevant. And we'll see all of this uh, very soon. Now, these are all issues uh, that will be relevant in this, in this election, but there's, al there's also some political news which is very uh, relevant. And that's the fact that there's some new players on the ground. They're not actually new players. I wrote here new old players because they've been in politics for a while, but they're coming with a new type of uh, vision and a new type of also strength. Uh, and I'm talking about two specifically, there's more. Uh, and uh, I, I don't mind mentioning them also. There's also some on the, on the left, for example, Ron Khuldai, which isn't here, uh, which was the mayor of Tel Aviv for a, a few decades and decided to enter national politics. Uh, but these two are the most relevant. Uh, one is Naftali Bennett. Naftali Bennett uh, has been in politics for, since 2012. Uh, around a month ago, uh, he was in the polls uh, set to uh, replace Netanyahu. He was doing incredibly well in the polls. Uh, he decided that he was running uh, in order to replace Netanyahu. Uh, unfortunately for him, the polls nowadays uh, are not in his favor. He's been going down steadily in the polls. Actually, today, he made a very big announcement around uh, two hours ago uh, that he made an alliance with a group of small business owners, which is very popular in Israel. And this might be a game changer, but it's too early for me to tell. Uh, but he's running with a different mission. He used to run in order to be a big right-wing party. Now he's running in order to replace Netanyahu. So that's the first person. The second person is Gidon Sar. Gidon Sar actually started his political career as uh, Netanyahu's uh, secretary of, uh, of cabinet. Uh, and so he was very close to Netanyahu in the past. He was a very high-profile Likud uh, minister uh, and Likud member of Knesset. Uh, but with time, his relationship with Netanyahu became very negative. Uh, and now, uh, a few weeks ago, a few, 
a few weeks ago, he decided to establish his own party, which is not Likud, uh, and to run against uh, Netanyahu in order to replace Netanyahu. He, by the way, took many of the votes in the polls from Neftali Bennett because people felt more comfortable. Now, why is this so significant? I mean, before I told you guys that every single election, there's a new challenger to Netanyahu and they're always changing every time it's someone else. But the difference is that this time and for the first time, we have challengers for Net against Netanyahu that are coming from his own camp. These are people that were in the right wing bloc and that are doing extremely well in the polls and that want to replace Netanyahu. And so this changes the whole picture. By the way, a lot of people on the left also realize that. And so you have a really interesting trend of many people on the left that are voting for these right wing, or at least saying that they will vote for these right wing people uh, in order to try and replace Netanyahu because they just want to replace Netanyahu. And they're saying after Netanyahu has been replaced, we'll deal with whoever has replaced him. But you have this interesting trend also that's going on. So these are new players. Now, I want to look at polls that were uh, actually uh, published uh, really recently. The 19th, sorry, uh, the 19th is today. I don't remember if it's today or yesterday, to be honest. Today, yes. So this, uh, those are polls from today. Uh, I, I remember that I updated them uh, really not long ago. So I actually updated them today. Those are polls from today. And it, this is what you can see in the polls. First of all, you can see that the Likud is doing well when it comes to being the largest party. Uh, but Lo look at New Hope, which is Gidon Sar's party that we just spoke of. Uh, he's, he's getting 17 uh, seats. Yeshati, there is a center-left party led by, uh, by uh, Yair Lapid, and he's getting 14 seats. Yamina is uh, Naftali Bennett's party. He's getting 11 seats. And then the rest is, uh, is more like uh, what, what we've seen in the past. What I want to tell you, first of all, is look at the number of colors that I put in this graph. You remember in the beginning, I basically had three colors, which were really two colors, and then also the Arab parties, which, were, were, which are non-Zionist parties, uh, but two colors for the Zionist parties. Here you have one, two, three, four, four different colors. Uh, and this is basically the source of the political mess that we have now. Let's try and see what the potential outcomes is. First of all, I'll show you one outcome, which to right-wing people might be the dream outcome, but unfortunately will likely not be the outcome as to what uh, uh, coalition we will see. Because of the different trends that I spoke about, including uh, alternatives coming from the right, uh, if the right-wing bloc would have sticked to being a right-wing bloc, then this election, the right-wing bloc, according to polls, would get 83 seats. I remind you that we used to get, uh, that the right-wing bloc used to get between 61 and 65 seats. And right now, if the right-wing bloc, the right-wing bloc is polling to 83 seats. And so this might be the dream Knesset, the dream parliament uh, for, uh, for right-wing people. However, the problem is that this is not really uh, the issue that matters right now uh, in, in Israeli politics. It's not anymore uh, on the right-wing bloc and the left-wing bloc. What we have right now is four different blocs where the central question in Israeli politics today is, do I want to see Netanyahu as prime minister or not? And there I put four different colors as to people, as to the ideas that people have on that question. First of all, you have the blue, which are sorry, different parties that are for Netanyahu. You have his party, you have the ultra-Orthodox parties, and you have religious Zionist party, uh, a religious Zionist party led by Bezalel Smotrich. That's 48 uh, seats. Then you have 51 seats that are against Netanyahu. For the first time, you have people in this block, which are also from the right, Gidon Sars party. Uh, and so that's a first, uh, but you have uh, this. And then you have in green, a smaller uh, part of the pie, but which is very significant. You have Yamina, which is Naftali Bennett's party, who is staying neutral. He's saying, I won't be for or against Netanyahu. I'm staying neutral. I'll do what's good for the country in, in, in his words, right? 
Uh, and then you have the Arab parties, which again, the Arab parties are non-Zionist. They're not for Netanyahu, but they're not, they're not for any other, uh, any other party. Uh, they, they're they're non-Zionist and traditionally they've been out of the game. The potential outcomes in here are a few outcomes that are in theory poten uh, potentially uh, possible. First of all, you have the potential of Yemina uh, going with the against BB uh, group. In other words, the green and the yellow uh, coming together. Now that might be statistically possible, but it would be incredibly difficult. And the reason for that is that you would need to have people like Naftali Bennett and people on the extreme left of the Israeli political spectrum sit on the same coalition. And that is something which is unlikely to happen. It's possible, but it's unlikely to happen. The other potential uh, possibility, according to these polls, is for, uh, is for us to actually get to another election. Because the, the, the right now, according to these numbers, unless someone breaks his promise to his electors, Netanyahu isn't able to uh, build a coalition, according to this specific poll. By the way, in some of the polls, he is able uh, with Naftali Bennett. Uh, but according to this specific poll, which came out today, uh, he's, not, he's not able because it doesn't get the, 60, uh, the 61, uh, the 61 uh, people uh, needed. Now, what could happen in the next few months, which could affect the elections? First of all, you might have a merger on the left. Right now, when we saw the different parties in the poll, you have a lot of, uh, of smaller parties uh, on the left. Look at Meretz, Kachol Lavan, Israelim, uh, and also Yeshatid, which is bigger, but it's also uh, not big enough. You could have a merger be between all of these uh, smaller parties, which would create an alternative from the left and bring a lot of people back to the left from the right. In other words, people that are right now saying they'll vote for Gidon Sar or Naftali Bennett just in order to replace Netanyahu will go back to the left. The merger on the right is also something which is possible. There are polls that show that if Naftali Bennett and Gidon Sar actually join in the same party, uh, they, would get, uh, they would become the largest party in Israeli politics. Now, this is uh, right now, in my opinion, unlikely to happen. Uh, because I think that they both want to be prime minister. And so I'm, I'm uh, not sure they'll agree on who comes first. Uh, and then the second thing is also that this would mean that Bennett would have to join uh, Gidon Sar in the no to BB camp and join the anti BB camp. And he's not willing to do that for now. He says that he wants to replace BB, but not in a, in a way that, uh, that uh, completely excludes serving under him. Uh, he, he doesn't want to exclude this from the table. The third possibility, and that is what BB is, is counting on, is that the vaccines uh, that's, that are going incredibly well, the vaccine rollout is going incredibly well in Israel, uh, that this issue uh, will save uh, Netanyahu. And Netanyahu has said in closed conversations that were actually filmed and then, uh, that's the problem with Zoom is that you can film conversations and then leak them to the press. And so that's what happened. But he said in closed conversation, that he believes that he's counting on the vaccines uh, in order to regain support from the Israeli public to show that no one else can be prime minister the way that he can, uh, and then to uh, get the Likud higher and to build a coalition uh, based on that success. He believes that when COVID is bad, then the incumbent is doing badly in the poll, but when COVID is doing better and vaccines are being rolled out and things like that, then that's an advantage for the incumbent. But again, the current forecast is that, according to the polls today, we will, we will most likely uh, go to election number five uh, in another few months uh, after, uh, after March. Uh, in other words, that no one will be able to uh, build a government. Uh, I'm finished now. And as uh, Alan said in the beginning, uh, we'll be happy to take questions. So uh, if you want to write them in the chat, uh, Alan is going to read them to me. Well, Dan, first let me thank you. That was quite, quite, quite an in-depth dive into the system that for some of us is a little bit difficult to understand. I think you've made it easier for us. We did have one request, Ian, um, uh, if we can make your slides available to 
those in attendance. If that's okay, then we do have a list we'll distribute it. Um, one of our questions, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions first and then we have several that coming out of our, our uh, audience. Um, you did speak about the successful uh, vaccine rollout possibly voting well or, or better for uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. <clears throat> and you also said that the pandemic would have a negative effect or might have a negative effect on the incumbent as it is around the world. Can you just take a slightly deeper dive and tell me where that actually would balance out the, the pandemic, the net effect of the pandemic on the upcoming election in Israel? Sure, and let, let me start by explaining a little bit of where we're uh, standing right now when it comes to the pandemic, because we're in a, an interesting, but also a, a little scary uh, crossroads right now. Uh, on the one hand, the vaccination uh, rollout is going incredibly well. Uh, I mean, I, I won't, I'm sure you've all seen the international news uh, that, uh, that the, the rollout in Israel is probably the best all around the world. Uh, but on the other hand, we're right now in a very bad wave uh, of, uh, of COVID, uh, probably the worst wave up until today. Uh, and the reason why is because while the rollout has been successful, we're, we're still, for most people who got vaccinated, only got one of the two shots. Uh, they can still get infected. A lot of them do get infected. Uh, also, the statistics shows that the people who are getting hospitalized now uh, are actually uh, younger because, and that's, that makes sense because we actually, on the one hand, there's more people that are, that are getting sick, but on the other hand, the older uh, population already got vaccinated, and so the, the disease is moving to the younger situation. And so we're in this crossroad where uh, yesterday, for the first time since the start of the COVID crisis, uh, we, we, it was announced that 10,000 people uh, got sick in one day. Now, I know that 10,000 is not a, a large number for large countries, uh, but for Israel, it's an incredibly large number. And it's, we're, we're in a dangerous time, uh, but hopefully uh, we can balance this up until we see the effects uh, of the vaccines. Now, when it comes to the political effect, uh, I want to split this into two. First of all, there's the, there's the political effect uh, that comes from uh, the, 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 the vaccination and also the disease. Most people believe that the vaccination uh, process will, will be completed uh, by the time the elections come. Uh, and if that's the case, then uh, probably will be either towards the end of the crisis or really already with the crisis behind us, one of the two. And so in that sense, this means that Netanyahu will come out, uh, will come to this election from a position of strength as a leader who managed to end the COVID crisis, uh, bring vaccines very quickly to a small country, thanks to his personal connections and prove to Israelis that he's the right leader. But on the other hand, as many of you probably know, COVID isn't just about health. It's also, and maybe for many people, it's first of all, about the economy and the economic consequences of COVID will definitely still be felt uh, in March and a long time after also. And in that sense, when it comes to small businesses that are mad at the government that closed them down, because we've had some very aggressive close downs here in Israel. And when it comes to other things that have affected the economy, uh, then uh, people might prefer an alternative. Naftali Bennett's strength, we spoke about him getting stronger this time around. His strength is that he's been consistently uh, criticizing uh, the, government's, uh, the government's dealing with COVID, by the way, in, 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 a very, in a very smart way. In other words, he wasn't being a populist. He wasn't uh, attacking baselessly. He always gave alternatives. And that's something that appealed to a lot of people. Uh, and they, they, he, he basically claims that there could have been other ways to dealing with COVID that would have hurt the economy less and, uh, and this still uh, saved the, the lives uh, of uh, the Israeli citizens. And so with this said, you can, you can see that on the one hand, it's hard to say where it will play, but on the one hand, it plays to Netanyahu's strength, but on the other hand, it's dangerous to him because of the economic situation. Thank you, Dan. One last question for me before we get to the floor. Um, 
I, I personally describe the developing Abraham Accords as stunning, and it's clearly negotiated agreements requiring compromises by all parties. Uh, but it's certainly a fresh approach to normalizing interactions between Israel and our Arab neighbors. Without completely dissecting them, can you comment on the impact of the Abraham Accords on the election? Does it favor one group or another? So I, I, wa I want to say something which is a little bit out of the box, but it's, it's, uh, I, th I think it's true. And I think it's interesting also. I think the, the Abraham Accords and specifically the fact that they made uh, the Palestinian issue less relevant uh, are actually one of the, the threats to Netanyahu's, uh, to Netanyahu's reign. Because when the Palestinian issue was relevant, he was able to keep the blocks quite stable. There was the left-wing bloc and there was the right-wing bloc. His success in making the Palestinian issue irrelevant uh, and going and signing a peace agreement with the Abraham Acc Accords might cost him uh, the political instability that we've seen now. Uh, that's, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, it's clear that the majority, and I'm, I'm talking about close to 100% of Israelis are very happy with the Accords. Uh, we, we think uh, both on the right and on the left, we think they're, in, they're a historical accomplishment. Whether people uh, credit Netanyahu for it or credit historical processes, that's already a political uh, opinion of each person, but people are, think it's very positive. But I think it's interesting that actually his success might come back to bite him the way we say, right? Such an interesting perspective. Um, ZLA National Board Member Cheryl Silvern, I know you touched on this, but she takes it to a slightly different place. Cheryl said that she saw an interview with MK Haskell on I-24 this week, in which she explained why she left Likud to join Sa'ar, uh, his new hope party. If Netanyahu defeats Saar in the upcoming election, would those who win MK seats from his party join with Likud to create a majority of MKs needed to keep the right in power? Unfortunately, right now, they're promising not to do that. They're not just stating they won't do that, but they're promising it over and over again. Uh, I say unfortunately because that could be a, a solution to the crisis, right? Uh, to, the, to the political instability. Uh, but at this point, uh, they feel that Netanyahu has to go. Uh, that's basically also the raison d'être, uh, pardon my French, right? Uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the party. It's, it's been built as an alternative to Netanyahu from the right. And so they're promising that they won't sit in a Netanyahu uh, coalition in order to show that they're serious about being an alternative. Uh, and I'm not sure, politicians know how to go back uh, on their promises, but sometimes when you make very explicit promises, uh, it's very hard to go back on them. And so even though my feeling is that they'd be happy, to be honest, They'd, they'd like to uh, sit uh, under a Netanyahu party if they don't win. They'd prefer winning, of course, but if they don't win, my feeling is that they'd be happy to sit under a Netanyahu party, but I don't think they'll be able to just because they're being so explicit in their, in their statements right now. I hope that answers your question, Cheryl. Uh, from a friend of ZOA from right here in our fair state of New Jersey, Yang Pelea. Is anyone considering changes to the election system to make endless elections unnecessary? And Yank offers an example. Let people vote for their one, two, and three choice. And if no coalition can be formed, eliminate the lowest vote party and take those number one votes and redistribute them among the remaining parties. Does any of that make sense? Is there any talk about something like that? Or is this system locked in place? It, the, the problem with electoral change is that everyone thinks it's needed. Uh, but the people who need to actually make it uh, go, pass are the people that are benefiting from the current uh, system. In other words, the people that got elected in the current system are the ones that need to pass a law that would change the current system and possibly uh, threaten their, their jobs. Uh, and so that's why it's never happened up until today. Uh, even though it's been years, even decades, that people are calling for electoral re uh, reform in Israel. Uh, whether this, the current political crisis might lead to electoral reform is a good question. I haven't thought about it, but I think that if it's ever been, if there ever was an opportunity, it would probably be uh, 
once we have a functioning government after this crisis, because people are feeling that now it's, it's really extreme. I mean, having five elections, four, sorry, I already went to the fifth one, even if it didn't happen, but having four elections in two years is, is, is completely crazy. Uh, and, and so it, it might, it might, it might uh, help it happen, uh, but up until today, people who have benefited from the, from, the, from, from the current system haven't been willing to change it. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Laura Green asks or states, the joint list has dropped significantly. What is the reason for this? Uh, so, so in the joint list, uh, you have some interesting, uh, uh, interesting patterns that, that in the last election actually went up significantly. And one of the reasons is because they actually got <laughs> their voter turnout to be very, very high. Uh, it's not necessarily that they got more uh, supporters, but they got a lot of people to turn out and vote. And so now you see part of the reason why, why they've gone down in the polls now uh, is that it's, it's basically normalizing against that trend. trend sorry. Uh, the other reason, which is something which is incredibly significant, is that there are a lot of Arabs uh, that have uh, come out and spoken uh, against the joint list as a political party. Uh, and saying that, that the Arabs need to stop uh, denying Israel's right to exist, but rather trying to integrate uh, into Israel, many of them even calling to vote for the Likud. Uh, one of the very significant things that happened is that Netanyahu uh, went to visit uh, one of the biggest Arab uh, city uh, in Israel, Nazareth, uh, and uh, people thought that he was going to offer the mayor of Nazareth uh, a place uh, in the Likud list. It didn't happen. Uh, but he did go and he had a press conference in it, uh, uh, in the city with him. And in, in uh, that press conference, the mayor of the, the biggest Arab city in Israel uh, called for the Arabs to actually start integrating and stop uh, just opposing Israel's right to exist. I feel that this is one of the consequences of the Abraham Accords, because the same way that they see normalization with the Arab world, they're saying, what, we're Israeli, why wouldn't we start normalizing also our relations with the state we live inside in. Uh, and so I think that that's one of the consequences of the Abraham Accords. And that's also one of the reasons, maybe the second reason, uh, why you see the number of, uh, of uh, voters for the Arab list going down because they're actually voting for Zionist parties uh, for the first time. There's always, by, there's always been Arabs that voted for Zionist parties, I have to say, just the numbers are, are, going, uh, are gonna be higher this time. Thanks, Dan. Jerry Katzoff asks, how does the religious Zionist party differ from Bennett's Yamina? So they actually were in the same party this time uh, around. Uh, it's Bezalel Smotrich and Naftali Bennett. They're basically the two leaders of the two parties. Uh, Naftali Bennett uh, said that he wanted to uh, try to bring in voters from uh, different uh, types of sectors of uh, society. And he even said one statement that got uh, Bezalel Smotrich a little mad. He said that in the next few years, I'm going to focus only on economic issues because this is what matters after COVID. Uh, and I will put all of the other issues that people don't necessarily agree with me about on the back burner. When he said that, uh, Bezalel Smotrich said, uh, I'm not willing to accept that. These other issues are the values for which I entered politics. They're the values for which I represent the religious Zionism. And so he created a, a different party, which uh, is on the basis of an existing party, but I won't get into that. He basically created a, a, another, another party called the Religious Zionist Party, which, which his, uh, his argument is that he will uh, promote purely religious Zionist uh, issues, whatever the, the situation is, while Bennett says that uh, while we have economic uh, difficulties and things like that, we can put these issues on the back burner in order to focus on things that everyone agrees on. That's basically their argument. Yeah, let's see if we can do two more questions and then we'll wrap up because we're, we're kind of pressed for time. I'm gonna kind of rephrase, Monique Berenbaum has a question that I'll, I'll rephrase a little bit. Um, but it is such an important issue, um, the Iranian issue, right? Uh, it's such, it bears such great impact, the possibility for nuclear proliferation. Does, does that issue have an impact on any candidate or block more than another block 
And can you speak to that just a little? At this specific point, the Iranian issue is not at all on the agenda in Israel. However, uh, if, it, if it is put on the agenda by world affairs, which is unfortunately a real possibility, uh, then I think it will benefit Netanyahu because there is no one that is more identified, by the way, no one in the whole world that is more identified with the Iranian issue uh, than uh, Netanyahu himself. And so it plays into his strength. Uh, right now, uh, it's not on the agenda at all. Uh, but again, there's still two months before the elections, uh, a little more than two months. Uh, and so this, uh, this can happen and it would play into uh, Netanyahu's strengths. And, and I think last question, Dan, zooming out about, I don't know, 6,000 miles and reminding our audience that we are a 501c3 and that we don't uh, favor or advocate for any particular candidate or party. Did the results of our recent elections in the United States, does that bear impact on your upcoming election in Israel? And can you speak to that? I think that w when it comes to uh, the relationship between Israel and the United States, uh, on that issue, again, uh, the very issue, whenever it comes up, plays into Netanyahu's strength. And it doesn't matter if you have an administration that is very pro-Israel, where Netanyahu will then say that he knows how to, uh, how to capitalize on that support, or if you have a confrontational uh, administration like we've had in the past, where Netanyahu will say that he's the only one that will know how to stand strong uh, against, uh, against uh, such an administration. And so I, I don't think that the result itself uh, has an impact. However, if the issue of Israel-United uh, States relations will come up until the uh, uh, to the agenda, it will again play into Netanyahu's strength. And I'll just end with this sentence uh, because uh, the last two questions you asked were basically on the same theme. Foreign affairs in general plays into Netanyahu's strength. As long as we're, as we're dealing with internal affairs uh, inside of Israel, uh, then, uh, then uh, it, some people will say that it plays into uh, Netanyahu's strength because he's very good in economics, but uh, I actually think that it doesn't play into Netanyahu's strengths because there he, he has other challenges. When it comes to uh, foreign affairs, uh, that's definitely into his, uh, it, that, that plays into his political strength. And I think if you ask what his political interest is, as much foreign policy as possible in the next two months. And that's why many times before the election, you will see that there's, that Netanyahu uh, uh, brings out uh, uh, rabbits out of his uh, cap, uh, which are always foreign policy issues, uh, whether it's, uh, it's speeches that he says around the world, or whether uh, always something that has to do with foreign policy, because as long as foreign policy is on the agenda, that plays to Netanyahu's strengths. Dan, you did such a fantastic job today that I'm going to ask you just to describe your upcoming programs and to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, one of the main programs that I really want to uh, uh, urge everyone to try and join will happen on three consecutive uh, Sundays in February. It's a partnership between the Judea and Samaria uh, Council, the Yesha Council in Israel, uh, the My Israel Organization and ZOA. Uh, we're, ha we're having Judea and Samaria Month, which will be uh, Zoom lectures, panels with top of the line speakers. Uh, for three consecutive Sundays, the 7th, the 14th, and the 21st uh, in February uh, at uh, 11 a.m. Right, Natalie? 11 a.m., right? Okay, at 11 a.m. Uh, and we'll have fascinating uh, speakers. We'll send uh, everyone more information, of course, but I'll just tell you that the president of uh, Israel has already agreed to speak shortly. Uh, the ambassador to the United States, Gilad Dan, of course, uh, Morton Klein, uh, from ZOA. Mark Levinson will also be uh, there uh, and we'll have some speakers also from the uh, Emirates that will speak and it will all be about different aspects that have to do with Judea and Samaria economically, security wise, and also when it comes to the legal aspects that have to do with Judea and Samaria. It should be an incredible program. That's great. Uh, I'm just going to remind everybody once more about a program that's coming up January 26th. Uh, the Jewish Historical Connection to Jerusalem, featuring Danny Ehrlich from Keshet Tours. That will be moderated by ZOA Deputy Director Howard Katzoff. I'm going to thank everybody one more time. Dan, thank you. If you like what you've seen and you have it, the ability, please support ZOA. 
uh, go to our website, hit the donate button. Uh, thank everybody for this support up to this point, And we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Have a great day.